An innocent person was killed today as police unleashed lethal force against protesting students. Let's get into it. Spread the fire fam, welcome back to SMWX. If you're new around here, my name is Dr. Cizwe Mbofu Walsh and on this channel, we explore South African politics through interviews and analysis. Firstly, thank you to everybody who's taken this channel to 20,000 subscribers. I was going to release my celebration video uh, for 20,000 subscribers, answering many of your questions, so thanks for those. But I've postponed that video because of the tragic events of today where an innocent person whose name at the time of my recording is not yet known was despicably killed by a police force in South Africa which only knows brutal force and yet again another innocent life is claimed over what is effectively a political question. So. In this video, I really want to help you understand what's going on. Uh, the mainstream media, in my view, often gets this totally wrong in their framing. It's important to understand, firstly, why students are even protesting in the first place, and then to take a look at some of the deeper and the broader dynamics, which often also get left out of news reports as they chase the 24-hour deadline headline. So. What I want to do in this video is firstly just give you a brief explanation of what exactly is going on right now, why right now student protests are gaining a significant momentum. I, I then want to move on to speaking about the broader question of police brutality in South Africa and how today's events only reinforce and only illustrate a much deeper and broader problem in our society which in many ways comes back to the ANC government. And then finally, I want to reflect on a few other questions related to how the media covers these questions, as well as some of the broader political questions which flow from the student protests, but also the violent reactions to them. So let's get started. I want to begin by just asking what's causing these protests and well, we could look as far back as we, as we want to, but I think we need to cast our minds back to early 2018, which in the wake of major student protests in 2015 and 16, under the banner of Fees Must Fall, forced the government to come to some kind of compromise over calls for free education. And effectively, the government compromised to the extent that it allowed NISFAS, the National Student Financial Aid Scheme, to essentially fund higher education for a much broader range of students than they were before. And of course, this placed extended pressure on the budget because this would cost money and the state was going to have to pay for it. But it also kind of led to some political shenanigans because the government pretended to be giving free education and campaigned on free education, but the story was actually a lot more complicated than that. So what happened was that in 2018, 19 and last year, NISFAS already still with some problems, the political mobilization has never really fully gone away, but NISFAS was giving out these bursaries or at least these grants to what they call deserving students and rolling them out to more and more students. And where we find ourselves now into this project is that the South African government is in a financial crisis. The money is running out and one of the places that it has decided to cut back is, guess where, higher education. And so now as a new cohort of students go into the higher education system, there's what they call a funding shortfall, which means government has run out of money. They're acting like the shortfall fell from the sky. The shortfall is of their own making. They don't have enough money to cash the political checks which they have written. 
And here we find ourselves in a situation where students are now placed in a very precarious position. Why is that? Well, you'll remember that as a result of COVID-19, matric results only came out much later than they usually do. So students had to apply for university, especially the, the newly entering students, which is where I want to focus because these are the most vulnerable students right now. The newly entering students into the university system had to wait for their matric results until very recently. Meanwhile, universities have been running ahead trying to register students and get on with their academic year. Um, you know, some universities have even start, started issuing deadlines for assignments and courses because the academic year has in many ways begun, but the registration process, which usually comes to an end much earlier in the year, hasn't ended. And that's because the National Student Financial Aid Scheme now has this financial crisis where you've got all these new students entering the system, universities wanting to get on with their, their programs, but the new students don't know whether they'll be funded or not. So imagine you're a first time entering student from a background of poverty. You've made it into the university. It's already March. You have your acceptance, but you don't know whether NISFAS will be able to fund you and you haven't got that final confirmation. So that's the kind of position that students are, are in right now particularly first-time entering students. Now, we know that this financial crunch has been exacerbated by COVID. So last year, for example, the university had to extend its academic year. They didn't want to leave all those students who are still in the system for an extended time in the lurch. So they had to keep getting paid certain monies to keep their livelihoods going while that extended year could be completed and that also further pressurized the system. And we already know that COVID-19 has wrought havoc on the South African economy and ANC governmental failures have wrought additional havoc over a very long time now. So essentially, much as this crisis has come to a head now, it has been building, boiling and looming for a very long time. Now, one other thing that has added pressure to the crisis right now is that because the economy is in such a perilous position and because incomes are depressed, wages are depressed, people are losing jobs, poverty is expanding, what we have now is more people qualify for this free education system under the National Student Financial Aid Scheme. They had certain income criteria. So if your family income fell below a certain threshold, then you would qualify to get funding by, from the state. Well, what's happened? Far more people now qualify because more people are poorer because of the immediate crisis of COVID-19, but the broader failures of the Ramaphosa and Zuma administrations and their economic decline has meant that there are now so many more poor people asking for NISFAS funding that it's hard for NISFAS to actually meet their promise of being able to fund everyone who could get funding. So as you can see, we're sitting in a situation in the higher education sector in South Africa that is extremely dangerous and placing many students who thought that there was a promise of free education in great deal of uncertainty, doubt, and this is why, and it's not surprising at all, why students have realized that the only thing they can do is protest. Now, where that protest needs to be directed is a whole new question, which I'll cover in subsequent sections of this, of this video, because of course universities have a role to play in some of this crisis, but it's a broader and a deeper crisis, and so many people need to appreciate their complicity. Let's move on to the question of police brutality as it relates to the way these protests have now been responded to. Okay, so I think many South Africans were shocked today to learn that an as yet unnamed person was unconscionably killed by the police in a typically heavy-handed, deadly response to an effective, 
effectively a political question, one around access to higher education and higher education funding and protests, rather legitimate protests over the accessibility of higher education. Now, across the country, but particularly at Wits University, students have been protesting for the reasons that I laid out in the earlier section. And their frustration has grown in proportion to the paralysis of the university sector's response. Now, the universities blame the government. The government blames COVID. The, the university vice chancellors say that it's the minister. The minister says that it's the National Student Financial Aid Scheme. The National Student Financial Aid Scheme says that it's the universities. I mean, nobody can take accountability in this sector. And yet many students are now unable to access the promises that were made to them. And in fact, not only that, but people are now being shot at for demanding what was promised to them. I think the tragic events, and one would have to say if by any chance um, anyone connected to the person who died is watching, you know, my deepest sympathies and um, deepest condolences to their family and anyone connected to them and anyone who was there um, who experienced the trauma of seeing that today. What we saw today is a symptom of a deeper malaise, a deeper problem of police killing, police violence in South Africa and its police violence in response to protests over governmental failures. So what happens is that the government makes a promise, it fails to deliver on that promise, which justifiably makes people angry because they are impoverished, they are oppressed, and they are trying to access opportunities to better their lives. When those promises are broken, it creates dissatisfaction and it creates protest. And you know, if you really take a step back and you look at the deprivation that continues to engulf South Africa, it's no surprise that there is protest. But what happens in response to that protest? Because the protesters haven't created the, the crisis. The crisis has been created by those in power. What happens is that those in power then unleash lethal force to try and intimidate and terrify those who protest into submission. And we've seen this on many occasions. We saw it at Marikana. And can you believe we'll be commemorating the 10th anniversary of Marikana next year and still not an iota of accountability for the senior politicians, for the senior police officials, for the senior people involved in major corporations who were all complicit in that intolerable and unconscionable mass killing of protesting mine workers. We saw it with the death of Collins Koza last year. In fact, police kill about 450 South Africans every year. And we saw protests erupting in the United States after the terrible killing of George Floyd by US police. But in South Africa, we know that police kill at least double the amount of people per capita that the US police kill. And so police killing and police brutality in response to protest, in response to citizens standing up for their rights and demanding better lives, has become a crisis of the democratic moment. It's not about today, it's not even about last year or what happened over the last five years, it's about the way the South African government responds to any threats to its legitimacy. And instead of grappling politically with the crises, many of which are of the government's own invention, the government would prefer to crack down on protesters and intimidate people into silence. And so what we must demand, and this is where universities and vice chancellors have been complicit, is we must demand an end to the militarization of political problems. If solutions can't be found at the negotiating table, 
then that doesn't mean that the police force and university management unleash private security guards and police forces to terrify people into into submission new solutions have to be proposed new political inventions have to be found and this constant recourse to violent force has to be problematized not just in the university sector but in society and in south africa at large all the senior politicians president ramaphosa himself and we can't forget his involvement at marigana have to become accountable and explain to us why their only solution to social problems is unleashing violent force against the citizens who themselves are suffering. And the, the real disappointing feature of this growing shame on our society is that we have been here before so many times. Student leaders have already been shot at for peacefully protesting shot in the back as they were running away rubber bullets have you know left scars on many student leaders for the rest of their lives injuries traumatic psychological states we've already been here and unfortunately the government those who hold power those who hold wealth in our society don't seem to be able to realize that these problems are going to keep recurring unless they can come up with a strategy to create a more fair society, a strategy which they have failed over three decades to execute. And so I really want to urge people to, to see the broader pattern here, the broader system at work here, as opposed to simply the actions of a few police officers and a few university administrators. So let me come on to a few other broader questions to end off. The first thing I want to talk about is the ANC government, because people seem too afraid to talk about this, and we have to talk about the ANC government, because it's the ANC government which controls the executive, which controls the police service. And I have a problem with people who are deeply connected to the ANC, people who are put in positions of power by the ANC government, coming out and pretending to send condolences to the victims of police brutality when it's their party and their government that are un that is unleashing this force and this violence and this death on the nation so if you are part of the ANC unfortunately you must accept complicity in this problem and stop pretending as if all you are capable of doing is sending condolences what are you doing about three decades of police brutality against your own citizens. So I'm really done with condolences from, from people um, and, and crocodile tears from people in the ANC and ANC government, which is brutally terrorizing citizens, but also wants to pretend like the ANC is somehow a victim in all of this. It's kind of like when the ANC pickets against racism. You are the government. How can you picket against a society which you have presided over for three decades and not see that you are complicit in the problems that have continued to plague our country? And, and here I want to urge student leaders because mistakes were made before where the ANC was able to co-opt uh, student politicians and student leaders and, and create confusion about where the ANC stood and eventually even took credit for free education. And I'm really urging people to see through that this time because this cannot now become a platform for the ANC to now go out and try and get votes when they are the party who are actually unleashing this cruel torture on citizens. So I'm done with these fake displays of outrage from ANC politicians who are in control of the government. I think also we need to foreground media complicity because anytime citizens in our country, which remember is one of the most unequal countries in terms of its distribution of wealth on record, 
anytime protest erupts which relates to this inequality and when people are trying to break through these ceilings of injustice anytime that happens the media pounces on the protesters and tries to paint them in criminal terms as if there's some existential danger to the society it calls violence inflicted on peaceful protesters clashes it says there's crossfire when I'm sorry I, I don't remember students ever shooting at people it tries to create this false equivalence between often legitimate protest and certainly the legitimate causes of protest and the senseless brutality that's met out against protesters in our country in our society there's no equivalence between the two and yet the media would have us be afraid of and it would demonize those who are pointing out the inequalities while it protects those who perpetuate and entrench and benefit from those equalities and so I think we also need to call on the South African media and call out the South African media for the way it creates these false equivalencies and before it even knows the facts frames protesters as an existential threat as some kind of violent mob when in fact there are very legitimate reasons why such protests would break out in the first place and often those people who are protesting have been made promises by the government by people in power promises that their lives will be better promises that they'll gain access to services like healthcare or education and those promises are broken if anything is dangerous in our society it's not the protests or the protesters it's the people who make false promises knowing how desperate people are becoming so i'm really keen to hear your thoughts thanks for tuning in again to smwx comment below you know we always have a good conversation and i try to respond and reply to as many people as possible share this video let's keep educating ourselves let's keep debating and dialoguing um, i'd be very interested to hear your views as i say but i think let's learn from the mistakes of fees must fall and remember who needs to be held accountable this is not just about a single police officer this is not just about a single vice chancellor. This is not even about the National Student Financial Aid Scheme. It's not even about the minister. It's not even about President Ramaphosa. It's about the ANC government, which has been in power for a very long time now. It's about who owns and keeps wealth in the society and funds the ANC and how the group of people in our society who hold economic and political power have failed to deliver on their promises and their only response is to crack down on the people who point out those failures. Ayeye. Ayeye.